Thank you, Dr. Deacon. So um, I slightly changed the topic and it's, uh, because I was going to look at bladder and prostate. But as I was going through it, I realized actually there's quite a lot to talk about in just prostate. So I've decided to focus on, on that. Um, so what I'm going to try and do is uh, explore the anatomical basis for lymph node templates and you know why historically we've done what we've done. Then define the different surgical templates for dissection. And you know there's a whole plethora of different uh, definitions of what are limited, standard, extended, super extended, and everyone is slightly different in how they describe them. And then look at the effic efficacy of those different templates for, for staging and, and what should we be doing because there's a wide variation in practice. And is there any evidence that you know extending your template is going to make a difference oncologically? Um, and also we'll look at potentially some of the side effects and pitfalls of, of extending your template. What I'm not going to include, uh, which I thought I might have time to, but actually as, as I delve deeper into the topic, realised it's you know, probably too much for a 45-minute talk is uh, pelvic lymph node dissection for bladder cancer. And the reason I decided not to focus on that is because there's, uh, at last year's ASCO, there was a, a big German uh, series looking at extended versus limited. Uh, and the paper's not out, so I thought we, you know, there's no point presenting it until you can look at it and scrutinise it in full detail. I'm not going to talk about penile cancer. Uh, my last talk looked at imaging in prostate cancer, so we're not going to really cover that. Uh, the, there is a role for nomograms, uh, and again, I'll briefly mention what some of the guidelines say about that, but I'm not going to go into specifics. Uh, and, uh, you know, I didn't want to stir up the hornet's nest, so I haven't talked about the various differences between different techniques uh, for open versus laparoscopic versus robotic. I briefly touch on some sentinel lymph node uh, topics, but not really as a, as a pure diagnostic tool, more uh, to help in the mapping. And... Uh, one of the hot topics is salvage uh, lymph node dissection in prostate cancer, and I haven't really covered that at all. So why did I choose this? I, mean, I think it's a clinically relevant topic. The number of prostates that, that are done, particularly at this center and the centers around it, is significant. Uh, and from my experience, both back home and here, everyone does a slightly different thing. Uh, and they, they kind of base it on their experiences. And I thought, well, is there any scientific basis that, that we can sort of tailor our approach? And should we be doing something different? And it was kind of something that I was interested in. And also, over the past 10 years, we're, we're sort of now not operating on low-risk prostate cancer. We're moving towards operating on high-risk prostate cancer. So actually, correct staging and management of these patients is going to become more important in the future. So uh, this takes me back to my boarding school days now, doesn't really. Um, but what are the controversies in, all about and, you know, why, why is it such a hot topic? And I think it's, it was a big session at the European section of uh, oncology earlier in the year. There was a whole uh, sort of morning about pelvic lymph node dissection. So some of the problems are, as I said, there's a lack of standardized definitions for what the templates are. So and even as we look at the guidelines, the Europeans say one thing, the North Americans say a different thing. Um, there's also a lack of clarity with respect to oncological outcomes. Um, and also, how does that affect the different uh, risk groups within the prostate cancer? And what about uh, the effects on functional outcomes? You know, are you going to do an extended node dissection? Is that going to make the patient the high risk of incontinence uh, and erectile dysfunction. And also, you know, they, they take longer. They're potential to have worse side effects and keep patients in hospital longer. So do we really need to do more extended uh, lymph node dissections? And actually, you know, there's a lot of, uh, well, this is based on my experience, this is what I do, but, you know, there's a move certainly where I come from that everything has to be standardized and, you know, patients should be risk assessed and then get a standardized operation so that we can look at outcomes uh, in, a, in a more defined criteria so that we can try and improve things. So I thought we'd go right back to anatomy uh, and look at what the landing zones for the prostate are. And, and as I sort of looked at this, I thought, well, let's see what all the different textbooks say because, you know, there is differences in, in all of these things. So Grace talks about the drainage of the prostate and the seminal vesicles and the vas drains to the external iliac nodes. The seminal vesicles drain to both the internal and the external iliac nodes. So we should think about covering those in our templates. And the prostate mainly drains the internal iliac, the sacral, and the obturator nodes. And you know, I'm not sure that, that, in my experience, many people have been looking at the sacral nodes. So you know, from an anatomical basis, should we be thinking about it? Uh, and we know that the, there's um, lymphatic channels that, that come from the posterior surface of the prostate, along with the, 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 vessel, the, the channels from the bladder to the external iliac nodes. And there's also one from the anterior surface joining the internal iliac nodes uh, from the membranous urethra. So, you know, we're already sort of getting an idea that, that you know, there's quite a wide variation in where these nodes drain to. 
last mm. anatomy again, slightly different. It says mm. that the lymphatics of the prostate cross the pelvic floor and drain mainly to the internal iliac nodes, um, but a few may reach the external iliac nodes, and that the seminal vesicles supply accompany the blood vessels to the iliac nodes. So here, no mention of the obturator, no mention of the, the presacral nodes. So again, the anatomy textbooks are saying different things to, to what the templates say. And then I thought I'd look at netters, and this is just a, a pretty picture just to keep everyone awake for a bit. But we'll look more focused in on the prostate in the, the picture in the bottom right hand corner. And they talk about the principal pathway being here. So the pathway going uh, along the inferior bladder vessels to the internal iliac nodes. Um, but other pathways also come from the periphysical plexus uh, to the external iliac nodes. So it makes sense that we should include those. But also these ones that run alongside the, the rectum to the middle uh, and rectal, middle and lateral sacral nodes. So again, you know, should we be including those in our template? And finally, these ones which we already talked about, uh, coming from the prostate membranous urethra to the internal iliac nodes. So we kind of now have got an anatomical basis of what the different textbooks say. Again, lots of variation, and so no wonder there's lots of different variation in the different templates that are discussed and you know people talk about limited, standard, extended, super extended, level one, level two, level three, but really no one can say exactly what they mean without defining the exact template they're talking about. And each paper or guideline will be slightly nuanced and slightly different in, in what they talk about. So you know again this needs standardizing. We need to, to think about this. So the EAU looks at different areas. So area one uh, would be the obturator nodes, area two the external iliac nodes area 3, the internal iliac nodes, and area 4, the common iliac nodes, with area 5, the presacral nodes. So that's how they sort of define the different areas. Um, if you look at Hinman's, again, slightly different uh, uh, templates. So limited would include the boundaries would be the obturator nerve, the external iliac vein, cloquase node, and the hypogastric artery, as well as the common iliac vein. So limited here is including the common iliacs, which are slightly different to some other definitions. For an extended pelvic lymph node dissection, you know, laterally we go to the genitofemoral nerve, uh, to the internal iliac artery posteriorly, the common iliac cranio superiorly, and the origin of the epigastric vessels distally, as well as what they would call the limited. And again, this is slightly different to other definitions of a, a, a extended. And then super extended would be all of those plus the nodes overlying the internal iliac and, and the presacral vessels. And again, this is another definition, just to show the wide variation. So this is a, uh, from a paper that we'll talk a bit more about in, in a sec, but um, extended pelvic lymph node dissection includes the commons, whereas that was uh, slightly different in other definitions, both internal iliacs and both external iliacs and both obturators, whereas the standard just is external iliac and obturator. So again, we're seeing a lot of variation. So how are we going to interpret that when we look at the studies that, that give us information on outcomes and, and number of nodes? And again, this is just another pretty picture to show, again, a different way of displaying the different node regions. Um, and couldn't get away without showing a nice robotic picture to, to show some clear anatomy. So what do the guidelines say? So the AUA guidelines are pretty sparse on what they say about what we should be doing for, for pelvic lymph node dissection. You know, they say that pelvic lymphadenectomy can be performed, um, but it's, and it's generally reserved for patients with higher risk of nodal involvement. But no talk about the extent of nodes, whether we should do one side, both sides, how far we should be going. So the EAU guidelines are a bit more specific. So they say do not perform uh, lymph node dissection in, in low-risk prostate cancer. And for intermediate risk, uh, they should perform an extended lymph node dissection if there's more than uh, if there was a risk based on mammograms of more than five percent of uh, positive lymph node involvement. And that all high risk patients should have an extended uh, lymphadenectomy. Uh, and so, just to remind you, going back, they give that uh, level of evidence as 2B grade, 2B grade B for, for that, but for the high risk, it's 2A and, and an A recommendation. And what that means is, you know, that that's a strong recommendation that basically we should be doing that. Uh, for, for high risk, all patients should be getting, getting extended pelvic lymph node resection. And what they define as the extended <coughs> pelvic lymph node dissection is the nodes overlying the external iliac artery and vein, the nodes within the obturator fossa, uh, including around the obturator nerve, uh, in and around the internal iliac. And each of these regions should be sent separately for analysis. So we shouldn't be just sending them 
right pelvic nodes, left pelvic nodes. We should be sending each specific area. Um, so that's what the guidelines say. In the NCCN guidelines, again, they choose uh, a risk of, of 2% for their cutoff for, uh, on the nomogram. So that's including quite a, a, a high number of patients. And again, they say it should be an extended pelvic lymph node dissection. Uh, and they argue that, that it will give more complete staging and may cure patients of micrometastatic disease, which I think is quite a strong statement. Um, and they think that extended is better over, over limited. And again, I'm not going to go through another template with you, but describe another template of what they define as extended pelvic lymph node dissection. So why do they? Why do they? All, why are they all different? Why does uh, you know? What is the basis for these different templates? Um, and, you know, have we got any mapping studies that, that give us some answers? So for staging, um, <clears throat> there's a number of studies with, I'm going to talk about. This one was back in 2008. Um, a German uh, students group, uh, basically 34 patients with uh, localized clinical prostate cancer, uh, were injected with the nanocolloid labeled with technetium 99, and then they had a spec CT and picked up uh, any positive nodes, and then went on to have a radical uh, prostatectomy with extended pelvic nodes as the gold standard to, to see you know, how accurate was the, the, the study. So of the 317 nodes detected on the spec, they were able to remove 300, and they found that two-thirds two of the nodes that were found with extended versus only one-third with the limited. So even with an extended, they weren't getting every... every uh, every node that lit up on the spec, um, but they were getting significantly more uh, with the extended versus the limited. And they they defined another template. So the old template would have, would have included uh, the internal external iliac and the obturator up to the iliac bifurcation. So that's the figure A, and you see that that gets most of the nodes. But by extending uh, to the common iliac, just to where the ureter crosses uh, on the other side, they were saying they were getting significantly more positive nodes based on uh, the nanocon the technetium injection. And again, another study, similar sort of thing, this is Van Poppel's group, looking at 74 patients, again with clinically localized prostate cancer, that had a negative CT, and the risk of lymph node involvement based on Parsons tables of 20 to 35 percent, so significantly more than what the guidelines are, are recommending. Uh, and did both scintigraphy and SPECT, uh, and then went on to similarly perform a, a super-extended pelvic lymph node dissection. Um, so what they would do is they would, they would use you know, detect the, the positive node interoperatively, dissect that template, and then go to the next one, and if they found another area, they'd dissect that template, and then afterwards they would dissect the whole template. And again, this is their definition. This is just another picture to show some nice anatomy and, and how, you know, what the different templates look like. Um, but again, here they found 91 positive nodes detected in 34 of the patients. And you can see that the vast majority of these nodes were, were found in the internal iliac, but also, you know, 5% in the presacral areas. And if we look at the, the number of positive nodes and, you know, how many nodes you need to get and things to, to get accurate staging, if you just do the obturator, you're only going to accurately stage patients in, in about 45 to 50% of the time. And you only really take a median of six nodes. Whereas if you extend that to, to their extended lymph node dissection template, including the presacral areas, that gets up to 33 out of 34 of the patients are correctly staged, uh, with a mean, median number of 18 nodes. And I'm just going to start to talk about number of nodes, because there'll be a few slides on that as to, to whether that's important or not. Um, again, this is a, uh, you know, 470 lymph nodes detected in this study. Um, the predominant landing site, as I said, was the internal iliac. And, you know, if you'd only, if you'd done external, the extended template, then 32 out of 34 of the patients would have been correctly staged. Um, but you would only remove 26 out of the 34, uh, all of the positive nodes in 26 of those patients. So you would have been leaving uh, metastatic nodes behind based on, you know, the, the nanocolloid uh, injection and what they found. Whereas if you extend it to the super extended, 33 out of 34 patients would have been found to be node positive, and 30 out of 34 would have had all positive nodes removed at the time. So, how do you know that they would have removed all positive nodes? Well, based on, so they're, they're basing it on, you know, what the, 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 the templates, so they, they would look at the, look at the, uh, the technetium and, and see whether they can detect it to set that template. And so it's a combination of doing that as well as doing a, a, a full 
you know, super extended to include the pre-sacral. So it's look, it was looking at basically the different templates and how accurate you're going to be. But you, yeah, I mean, you don't know whether there's a deposit higher up and that's not included in that template. But based on just into the prostate, sort of sextant. Uh, sextant. Yeah. <clears throat> And that's a good question because that there's another paper that did it slightly differently that gives a bit more information. Does that imply there's <coughs> uh, skip lesions here when you find a higher yield on the extended dissection? You might have skip past the. Uh, Potentially, the yeah. Potentially. Uh, there's another slide on that coming up. So they did find that there was a bit of morbidity. So eight patients had lymphocytes, and in total, 23% of patients had some kind of. Uh, uh, morbidity that was potentially associated with having extended versus a limited, and they they said that based on you know the way they looked at the pathologies, they they looked at you know the, what the limited template would have been, and they said well, about twenty percent of patients with just a limited template would have been incorrectly staged because they had positive nodes beyond that template, and if you only did the obturator, then fifty three percent of patients would have been incorrectly staged. So that's quite significant, um, and. Although standard uh, standard extended pelvic lymph node dissection, so not including the presacral area, uh, would have correctly staged most patients. About thirteen percent of positive nodes would be missed. So this is again another paper looking at a different template than why this this helps. Around this time, Bob was offering a very advanced disease, T3s that are coming out of Europe. Uh, you know, they're very aggressive in terms of what was the characteristics of patients in this population? Uh, um, so, uh, quite locally advanced, and that's clinic, clinically localized, so I mean, I didn't. Yeah. Um, a lot of more T3s in the local I can look that up for you later. Uh, but I mean, there's another study. So, again, this is 52 patients with uh, intermediate high risk prostate cancer and had a prostatectomy with extended pelvic lymph node dissection. And they, when they did it, they looked at all lymph nodes greater than three millimeters and did uh, quantitative uh, reverse transcriptase um, polymerase chain reactions to look for PSA expression, uh, as well as standard uh, pathology. So mean lymph nodes dissected per patient was 27, so pretty high. Um, and of the molecular analysis, 127 lymph nodes in 27 patients were positive. Uh, and that was in 32, patient, 32 lymph nodes of 12 patients that had positive histopathological nodes. And interestingly, they found that the molecular examination was negative in three out of the 35 patients with pathologically positive nodes. So putting this together, um, you know, that's just repeating, so I've managed to repeat that in those slides. 71% of positive lymph nodes based on both molecular and pathological <laughs> findings uh, were found in the standard template, so pretty good. But if you looked at adding the internal iliac and the common iliac, you could add another 16 and 13% of positive nodes based on this. So of the positive nodes, 63% also had a met outside the pelvic, the, the standard sort of uh, pelvic lymph node dissection template. So again, showing that we should perhaps be doing more to, to stage our patients better. Um, and the internal iliac involved 48% and the common iliac involved 37% of positive nodes. And actually, interestingly, there was talking. This is coming back to your question about skip lesions, or, or you know, in some patients, there were seven percent of patients that had positive nodes just in the internal iliac, and eleven percent just in the common iliac. So we then we've talked a little bit about number of nodes dissected and whether that can influence the accuracy of your staging, and you know, is it a marker of quality? So this was a, a study in uh, 2012, a retrospective analysis of uh, you know, nearly 21,000 prostatectomies with pelvic lymph node dissection, and the, lean, the mean node count was 6.4. Uh, and they sort of subclassified it into low, intermediate, and high risk, and obviously you know, positive nodes were found in 2.5% of the whole population, as you'd expect in the high risk population, there was 6.7% of positive nodes. But then if you look at the number of harvested nodes, compare it 10 to, to 20, uh, lymph nodes, uh, then you know you found 3.5% were positive with only 10 nodes and 6.7 with 20 nodes. And they looked at this in a multivariate analysis, and I, I, again, I'm not a statistician, so don't ask me difficult questions about that, but basically they found that lymph node count was an independent predictor of positivity. So again, saying we should be doing more lymph nodes. And for them, they said that a, a number of 20 gave a 90% uh, 
probability of correctly staging uh, a patient. So again, uh, these, these authors say we should be doing extended pelvic infinite dissection. Uh, and again, a similar sort of study, looking at 858 patients, uh, their, their mean and median numbers of lymph nodes are significantly higher compared to the other group. Um, so whether they were doing uh, more extended as a matter of routine, but again, found the more nodes you get, the more positive ones you find, which kind of makes sense. And they would say you need to, to harvest at least 28 nodes to get a 9% ability to detect positive nodes based on their analysis. And again, this is just another cadaveric study that says, you know, if you do a super extended, an extended template versus a standard template, then you're going to find more nodes. So it makes sense. And what about unilateral pelvic tube node dissection? So um, going back to one of the studies I presented before, uh, you know, in only 18 patients, so 27%, so less than a third of patients, the, the central node was located unilaterally. Um, and this is an interesting study. It's, it's fairly recent, uh, small numbers, um, but this comes back to, to Dr. So's question about where the injection was. So they looked at the uh, mapping with uh, endocyanin green, uh, 42 patients, intermediate and high-risk prostate cancer, went on to have a prostatectomy and extended pelvic lymph node dissection. And these 42 patients had slightly different injection techniques. So some were at the prostate base, some in the mid portion, some in the apex, some in the left, and some in the right leg. And what they found was that the external and internal iliac nodes would encompass most of the central nodes, and the common and iliac node contains up to 22% of the nodes. So again, saying we should perhaps be extending our, um, our templates. Uh, and that the, the prostatic load can drain into the contralateral group of pelvic nodes. So saying, well, you know, questioning whether we should really be doing unilateral node dissection. Um, but they conclude by saying it's pretty complicated uh, and that central node uh, techniques are pretty difficult and can't, can't be used. So this is just a picture to show if you look at the bottom two on the right, that if you inject on one side, you actually find the, the tracer on the opposite side in, in fairly significant quantities. So it's not, you know, not small, small fry. You know, you're finding. Uh, so if you look at the, the middle picture on the bottom, you're still finding, you know, 20% uh, in, in sort of standard template versus 30% on the other side of injections based on unilateral injection of this, uh, this in the signing uh, green. Uh, it was in the in the signing green. Oh, really? but so if you look at the so so each oh, picture right. shows what so different patients have different injections. So if you look at the bottom uh, picture, that this patient had three injections on the left hand side of the prostate, and it shows that you could detect the in the signing green from the contralateral side in you know almost equal uh, volume. And then what about periprostatic fat? That's another question that you know we often send the periprostatic fat. Should we be doing it, and does it make any difference? So this is a um, published in BJUI some a few years ago now, and most patients having a RAP will have the, the, the periprostatic fat sent, uh, and they found that 20 out of 120 patients that they sent sent on had lymph nodes within the fat, with a mean node count of 1.5, and in about three patients those were lymph node positive, um, but when they went on to do the pelvic lymph node dissection, those nodes were negative. And again, another study, this is from uh, two, two previous fellows uh, from this institution, so John Anning and Anthony Kaparish were involved uh, out of Bristol, and they sent the anterior prostatic fat from 282 patients, 29 of them had uh, lymph nodes within the anterior prostatic fat, uh, and four out of the 282 were positive, so less positive than the other group. But we don't, we didn't, they didn't look at sort of the characteristics of the patient. All we don't know is does it make any difference uh, to longer term oncological outcomes? It's just really you know, a, a point of technique. Should we be sending it probably uh, as a separate thing? So we come on to the oncological outcomes. You know, um, is there any evidence that by doing an extended dissection technique that we're doing in, anymore to cure the patient. And I think the evidence here is a bit sketchy. And if you look at um, this paper uh, from only last year, 460 patients, a retrospective review, uh, 262 had an extended and 198 had a, a limited. And again, you can see that in the mean node count, that kind of makes sense. And actually, if you look at the seven-year biochemical uh, re uh, recurrence-free survival, those with a limited seem to have a better outcome than those with an extended. 
Um, so their conclusion was that, that you know limited might actually be better. But then you sort of look into things in a bit more detail and you realize that the two groups are not the same. Um, so those that had the limited were only least in score six and, and uh, the vast majority of T1C cancers, whereas those that had the extended were more aggressive. Um, and they also excluded patients with positive nodes in their analysis and those with positive surgical margins and those that had adjuvant treatment. So really, you know, it's not really answering the question in this paper that we need to answer. And again, it's retrospective. There's actually very few randomized controlled trials with mature data looking at, you know, the oncological outcomes for these different uh, techniques. But this paper out of Brazil uh, was uh, presented at AUA a couple of years ago. Uh, and basically, 216 patients with intermediate to high-risk prostate cancer were randomized one-to-one -one, uh, to limited to extended pelvic lymph node dissection. Problem is here, the median follow-up is only 13.4 months, so not really long enough to, to make any meaningful uh, meaningful conclusions. Uh, and again, as you'd expect, more nodes seen in the, the extended, more positive nodes seen in the extended. So they, they again argue that it's better for staging, but as yet, oncological outcomes, there's no difference because you know, the follow-up's immature. But I think uh, this is one that, that we'll talk about a bit later, and hopefully in the next few years, they'll have sort of at least five-year data for us to look at. And then we come to the other confounding variable, you know, well, what happens when you send your uh, specimen to the lab? Uh, you know, does this have an impact? Um, so this is a paper uh, from 2014, I think, from uh, Jimmy's part of the world, 109 uh, pelvic lymph node dissections examined. And without sort of getting bogged down into it, they basically first looked at all the palpable nodes, uh, and which was their sort of standard technique, and then would re-block all the tissue that was left and look, look under the microscope at them for, for more nodes. And if you look at the graph on, on the bottom left-hand side, basically the darker areas is what would standardly be picked up by you know, palpating the, the package uh, and would be the standard process of you know, counting the number of nodes. But then by blocking all the residual tissue, the gray areas show uh, more positive nodes or more nodes uh, seen. And if you look at the, there was one patient where had, the patient had positive nodes that were in impalpable nodes, so micrometastatic deposits. And again, they looked at lymph node count, and it seems to be that the, you know, the, for the finding positive nodes, they sort of had a 30 to 35 uh, lymph node count that would be the number that you should be aiming to get. But again, a slightly different uh, handling of the tissue. And again, another way they did a similar thing, so rather than just palpating, they would then block all the tissue here. Um, and if they look, this was a sort of retrospective review published over this year, looking at um, patients that used the previous technique versus the new technique. Uh, and so when using the new technique, there was a significant increase in finding more lymph nodes. And there, there was no change in, in between the two time periods in the number of packages that the surgeons were sending them. So again, handling of the specimen makes a difference. But the flip side of that, and pathologists, you know, make a valid point that the number of blocks they then have to look up almost doubled between the uh, before and after. So, you know, are we going to ask them to do all this extra work for, for anything? Is it is it worth it? Who knows? So putting it all together, it's uh, quite a lot of stuff to, to think about, a lot of confoundings, and uh, thankfully I didn't have to, to do this. Uh, there was a systematic review published, well, it's actually in press, not, not out yet, and these guys looked at over 4,000 different papers and, and whittled it down to 66 studies that, that met their inclusion criteria uh, in the systematic review. And only four of those were, were level one evidence randomized controlled trials. So pretty sparse evidence, you know, looking at the whole picture. There were four prospective non-randomized trials and 59 retrospective uh, non-randomized trials. And only of those, less than half looked at the oncological benefits of the different staging techniques. And I'm not going to go into all the details of all the different papers, but they basically said that the quality of evidence was poor, only found four randomized trials out of the four th over 4,000 screens, and there was a significant risk of bias within the groups. They sort of said, as I've said, all along, there's no standardized definition. You just have to look at a couple of papers to realize that you know the, the templates are different, whatever you read them. Uh, there is no good evidence that, that any kind of pelvic infinite section, so not even... Uh, limited or uh, standard, but any kind improves your oncological outcomes. 
and there's no evidence that extended is any better than uh, than standard or limited. Um, and actually, that the pelvic lymph node dissection was associated with significantly worse interoperative and perioperative outcomes, but interestingly, no difference in functional outcomes when you looked at all the all the evidence available. But they say that you know, in theory, it could be curative for those patients with lymph node positive disease. And that although biochemical recurrence is likely in those with limited nodal disease, evidence of clinical progression is seen in less than 50%. And if you remove a higher number of positive nodes, then this appeared to be associated with an improved prostate cancer-specific mortality. But again, we need some good level one evidence with mature data to be able to, to follow that. So they say that, in conclusion, that uh, pelvic lymph node dissection may be a good stratification tool for those patients who may benefit from adjuvant treatments, and that's really one of the, 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 the things that we need to think about is, you know, is this able to, if they've got positive node disease, can we think about multimodal treatment uh, and, you know, to offer the patient the best chance of cure. And they therefore conclude, you know, based on pretty shoddy evidence that we should be doing extended lymph node dissection uh, to improve the prognosis for, for N1 disease. So this is a, a quote from Oscar Wilde, and I think it rings true for this. You know, the truth is rarely pure and never simple. So, you know, I, I've kind of done all of this and not really any clearer as to, to what the answer is. And the problem with finding the truth is, you know, you look at that one paper, he says, well, oh, there's no difference between uh, limited and extended. You know, we can't com we've got to c compare apples with apples. You can't suddenly throw a pear into the ring and say, hey, what's, what's the difference here? You know, Patients need to be compared based on their, their risk group, uh, and, and com comparative analysis needs to look at that. Also, some of the surgeon, surgeons need to be meticulously stick to their templates. So, some of the criticisms uh, I mentioned this, this uh, paper out of Germany, looking in, in the bladder sphere, were that you know their limited uh, lymph node dissection was so good that you know it, it was not much worse than their extended, and therefore you can't you know that's why there was no difference seen in this paper. But again, you know, what is the optimal template? You know, well, so so there was no difference between the two. Yeah. So in the outcomes, between they, they looked at limited versus extended. And is it worse? Is it all descriptive? My funny language. I'm sorry. Uh, but again, you know, the optimal template needs to be defined. We don't know what the optimal template is. And again, you know. We need to look at pathology and say, okay, well, what should we be doing on that end? You know, I'm not a pathologist. I'd like, you know, just some interesting findings based on the papers. And you also need to be aware of the Will Rogers effect. You know, you're changing the populations of patients we're treating by extending their lymph node dissection. That you know, you have to be aware of that when you're looking at um, analyzing the results. So. There's a few directions. There are actually two prospective trials ongoing. Um, one I mentioned already was this group in Sao Paulo who presented a couple of years ago with 216 patients. They're still recruiting, hoping to read out in February 2018 and have uh, a prostate cancer specific mortality at one of the, the endpoints at 10 years. So you know, we have to wait a bit to find the results. Uh, we work with interest to see, see what's going on there. And again, another study in Germany, which is due to complete uh, this summer, uh, but again, we may have to wait for the data to, to see uh, what the outcomes are. So that's it. And then uh, this is this last slide is just, uh, I was on my way to Seattle the other weekend, and I, I thought we've come a long way since, uh, with Viagra and Cialis since uh, back in the day. So, any questions?